Hi everyone and welcome to uh, Innovating for Good. Uh, this is a monthly series brought to you by UNHCR Innovation and Plus Social Good. Uh, more than a buzzword, innovations become a, necess a necessity in uh, the humanitarian sector. Um, it's more than new technology. Uh, innovation in the humanitarian sector is about being adaptive so that we can efficiently face new challenges. It's also about finding new, creative and sustainable ways to solve our biggest problems. Um, Innovating for Good wants to have a dialogue about how innovation can impact humanitarian work. Last month we looked at how SMS technology is being used in humanitarian crises. Uh, now today we'll be talking about alternative designs for temporary shelter. So with us today are Johan Carlson from uh, Better Shelter and Tom Corsellis from the Shelter Center based in Geneva. Um, I wanted to introduce the, the two of, our, the two of uh, our guests who we're very lucky to be hosting today. Um, Johan, uh, maybe I can ask you to, to introduce yourself to, to the audience and uh, give us a bit of an overview of, of who you are, what you're working on, and what you have been working on over the past couple of years. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm Johan Carlson. I'm currently the head of business development at Better Shelter, and that means that I uh, the, I'm responsible for our offerings in the products development, but also service uh, development. We, what we are doing, we are doing temporary shelters, um, which are fly-in solutions uh, for you know emergency and temporary shelter needs in the humanitarian sector. So I'm working uh, responsible for the product development and also the service uh, development. But uh, before I, I took on this role, I have worked with this organization for the last now five years in developing. Uh, a new shelter solutions, which is what we call the Better Shelter Unit today. It has been in the media, we refer to it as the IKEA shelter or the IKEA UNHCR flat pack shelter. It had many names. Uh, I've been uh, the project manager from this. We started out as an R&D team, working very much hands on with product design um, and uh, developing a prototype which we have tested. And then the last year, I have uh, my responsibility has to bring this from an R&D product and, and to transform it into a business and set up the supply chain and production and everything uh, to what is required for us in the position we are today, where we are soon about to start delivering shelter to UNHCR uh, for food operation. Thanks very much, Johan. Um, and then I also wanted to, to introduce you to Tom Corsellis from the Shelter Center. Tom, if I could ask the same of you to, to give us a bit of an overview of uh, what you're working on now, what you've been working on over, over the past couple of years. Hello, everyone. Yes. Um, uh, shelter Center um, supports the global humanitarian community of practice looking at shelter and settlement. We do that with uh, uh, um, global meetings. Uh, regularly a, a global knowledge management uh, uh, system, uh, an online library, you can have a look at humanitarian library online, uh, but also we, we look to identify common sector projects of, of interest to people implementing on the ground and, and one of those started way back in 2006 was, was looking at this transitional tent approach after we introduced a transitional shelter approach earlier during operations with UNHCR in, in Sri Lanka back in 2005. This transitional tent project involved first us agreeing as a humanitarian community standards for uh, the shape and size of the shelter and so forth, and then asking a series of manufacturers to, to come and produce uh, prototypes against those standards and also to inform the further development of those standards. That's where I first met Johan, and, and, and Johan came in to that group, one of the the, the, the eight manufacturers um, uh, who, who came in on that. He has since taken the, the, the progress that we made uh, uh, some years ago and moved them on considerably, really taking on not only the ethos of the proposal and the design, but also uh, engaging uh, in manufacturing processes so that um, uh, the, the ideas generated, the, the, the general consensus agreed, could be taken forward to its next steps. And that's the challenge uh, always in, in, in creating uh, innovative solutions, is actually carrying the idea through to the end. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. Thanks very much, Johan, and welcome to welcome to, to this week's uh, this month's discussion. So I wanted to I wanted to, if I may, uh, run through a couple questions with with the two of you, uh, noting your your different experiences with the uh, within the shelter realm within the humanitarian sphere. And Tom, I wanted to I wanted to start uh, with you. Uh, you've already touched upon some of the points that I think you 
that we're going to be discussing today. But to help us uh, put this topic into context, can you tell us what some of the biggest shelter challenges are for, for organizations such as UNHCR, such as uh, some of our implementing partners, such as Care International, uh, and so on and so forth? Sure. Um, the first thing to think about in shelter, of course, is that the vast majority of shelters will be locally built with local materials. And they should be built like that. Um, uh, it is you're, you're building with the technology that people understand, using materials that people know how to build with, and they know how to, to maintain. However, there are very specific circumstances, uh, given the urgency of need, given environmental fragility, and given also the need for people to move around, uh, where these sorts of shelters, um, transitional tents in this case, uh, uh, are impor an important contribution. So some of the challenges people are facing in shelters is that when they're displaced, when, they're, when they become refugees and persons of concern for UNHCR, is that they're having to move from location to location, that they're having to move very quickly. But also, they might have to stay in that location for a number of years. And in doing so, the usual emergency shelter solutions, the, the, uh, the, the tentage, won't last long enough to be able to, to cover them over the duration of their displacement and uh, support their return back to durable solutions when they get back to their, their home countries. And so the major challenge for us is, is, is not building a house, which I, I think uh, all UNHCR uh, shelter people would have no challenge to do, but to be able to create an environment where the needs of those affected can be supported rather than us leading their, their shelter solutions. It is their decisions and their solutions that we seek to support. And uh, the hope is that, that these transitional tents are going to offer uh, another tool in the toolbox to help us do that with them. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. I think uh, I think you've touched upon some some really interesting points. Uh, and I, I wanted to. I, we actually had a question from uh, from Twitter. Uh, so Johan, before uh, before I, I ask you the next question, uh, we had a question from uh, from Ross Kincaid, uh, who tweeted to us. Uh, and I think this is a good question for you, Tom. Uh, do you think self-built shelters with design guidance are a viable option at times? I, I mean, in, in experience, they're the default response. You very definitely, so yes. Um, uh, and it is something, an approach, which is used consistently in, in, in much of UNHCR's programming, but also in much of the programming of other agencies. Uh, the idea is that you might do something called a phased materials drop, where you come around with materials, you drop off some materials, and you come in and give technical advice. And you continue that process until the shelter is built um, uh, safely and, and, and correctly. So, so yes, uh, self-built shelters with design guidance, an excellent uh, uh, general approach. There are circumstances where that is not possible, uh, and that is where these forms of shelter, such as the one uh, being produced by Johan, are relevant. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. I think that was, uh, was a clear answer to, to Ross Kincaid, who had a question from Twitter. Um, Johan, I wondered if we can uh, if we can segue from the from the, the kind of the big picture uh, that, that Tom's given us um, and uh, and fleshed out. Actually, thanks to thanks to Ross's question, maybe you can maybe we can drill down a little bit. Um, so we're moving from the from the the big picture. Um, I wanted to ask you, with specific regard to the, the previously named refugee housing unit, the now uh, newly named Better Shelter, um, how do you account for all of the complexities such as those mentioned by Tom in your design process? So I wondered if you could take us through the design process, uh, the first steps, initial sketches designed, all the way through to, to the first prototype. Um, and after that, we're going to we're going to move on to to the utility and the and the, the value of, of human centered design. So over to you, Jan. Yeah, uh, thank you. No, I think the the biggest challenge when starting an innovation uh, project is is to find a focus of what are we going to do to address the questions uh, right. Because I think it's very easy when you start a product like we did, you know, uh, looking at the tents that uh, we use today, you know, and they, they're, they're fairly similar to the one that Alexander, Alexander the Great used in, you know, in uh, uh, Persia now for some 2,000 years ago. And when you're saying something like that, which we, which we did, you know, we were not very, you know, uh, uh, into humanitarian response when we started it, 
then, then you create expectations, and and uh, I often think it's it's easy to create expectation of that we are creating a silver bullet solution, which will work everywhere, which is not the case, and that is I think something that you really need to realize as a designer, and you also need to manage those expectations towards various stakeholders who are in this case in IKEA Foundation, who are sponsors, uh, you know, to the our partners in UNHCR, and also to the private sector, that we are not creating a silver bullet solution, but we have actually have to address a, a one uh, problem. And what we nailed it down to was that we're going to develop a fly-in solution um, in areas where it's needed, and that was usually where we had, um, you know, remote locations with very little localist materials when logistics was very complex. But when we have a, a big scale of the uh, influx of refugees, we need to bring in a solution you know, to deploy it to set it up on time. Um, we are not going to do something which are uh, replacing, you know, local made solutions because all research um, is against that. All experience that we have discussed with humanitarian agencies is against that. However, that does not mean that this product is not, you know, needed. It has to be a very pure uh, and good function. I think that was the first thing. And then there was also, of course, this long wish list of requirements. You know, you should it should not cost more than a ten today. It should last for three years, whereas if the tent lasts for roughly one year, uh, you know, it shouldn't wait more than a tent. And what we saw that all the requirements, they were basically the same requirements as we had on the tent. And if you don't change these requirements, then you're going to come up with the same solution, which would be a tent. And I think that's what we, you know, we worked really hard the first year to, to find new materials, new production technologies, which could bring us away from this. But then we realized that if, if we're going to stick to these requirements we are having, uh, we're going to come up with the same solution. So again, you know, the, the, the design brief is, 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 is crucial and in, in to question that one. And that's, I think, where we had the first breakthrough with UNHCR, where we said, okay, we're not going to be able to, to do this. We have a very possible equation here of upfront cost, the durability of the shelter, uh, and, uh, and also the, the weight and the volume, you know, requirements. Uh, if we can change one of these parameters, we can do something different or two, but if we're going to keep them exactly like we have with the tent, you know, it's going to cost something like, I think our first target was $500 for those 50 kilos and be something like over two cubic meters, then we're going to come up with the same solution. If that doesn't mean we agree to that, okay, that actually would make sense for us to make something with a higher upfront cost which could last longer, and which also would be, you know, compatible with sphere standards, something that you could you know, walk upright in, have, you know, sufficient height of the shelter, sufficient uh, foresight, etc. So when we realized that, and that gave us some more room uh, to innovate. And yeah. and from from there, I think that then it was more like the hands-on development work, the design work. And that's not much different from any other design work, actually. You know, you prototype, uh, you test, you, you know, you, you fail, and then you try again, and uh, and then you put from there, and that's, I think that's where uh, that's how the process has been. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Johan. So, so I think um, so. You you basically revisited the you revisited the the expectations of of the various stakeholders. As you um, you went back and and wanted to really force the force uh, the difficult questions around uh, the requirements that that UNHCR perhaps were were looking at. Um, so, and I think this this helped to frame the project, uh, drilling down from some of the uh, drilling down from some of the the big um, the big questions that, that Tom was talking about, um, drilling down to the resetting expectations and and re-questioning um, what the needs are. Um, I think the a really important part of the process that that we went through together with the refugee housing unit, now the Better Shelter unit, was um, the involvement of the end user. So I wondered whether whether you could speak to that point. Um, how did we engage end users, um, and and not just the not just uh, the kind of perceived needs um, of humanitarian agencies such as such as UNHCR? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what we, we did was, I think we had the two-stage user involvement. Uh, I think first, when we started the project in, in the first place, uh, you know, we did do user research of refugees who were not in camps, who actually were in Sweden, and we had, we had lived in the Dab camp, we had a small community here. That was actually very informative, because that gave us sort of the soft and technical value uh, in uh, what the problem was with the, with the shelters and the tents that they had been living in. 
But then, of course, it has been crucial that we have worked in the field um, and had these shelters built by um, refugees. Uh, we have revisited them several times, and that had fed into us uh, a lot of insights that we would else not have had, uh, and which have actually informed the design of the shelter, which has made quite a you know, transition from the model that we field tested you know, in Dolorado and Iraq, uh, now soon, two years ago, to the to the model we're having right now. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Johan. Um, I, so I wanted to ask. Uh, I wanted to ask one one more question of you, and then and then I'm gonna and then I'm gonna move back to Tom, if I may. Um, so the the last question that I wanted to to ask for the time being. Um, so there are several temporary shelter designs out there. In fact, more than shelter, more than several. Um, I think we we did a lot of uh, research together. Uh, you you guys probably did a lot more research than than I did, but but there are many temporary uh, shelters designs out there. Um, what's what's different about the better shelter unit? You know? uh, well, it's you know, it's I think it's possible to, to compare it to all of the other solutions because again, they are all uh, different. Uh, what I think is a key feature that we are having uh, is uh, the lifespan, you know, and the size of the shelter. Uh, with a reasonable, you know, upfront cost, which is today 11.50 uh, US dollar, um, that's what we have uh, resolved. Then there is so there are so many alternatives uh, out there, but we could see that because in many aspects, you know, humanitarian shelter has been a, a playground for architects and designers, and I think in most architecture schools around the world. You have like a you know five-week course on sort of ten-sided structure, structures or humanitarian shelters uh, because it's, it, um, it contains a lot of, lot of architectural elements and, and challenges um, to do that. I think what a lot of the science that we have seen are focused on, they have had been perceived that we need Formula One solutions like really rapid deployment sort of you know airdrop <laughs> shelters that has been the, the context we have seen uh, from innovators and engineers and what. Whereas something that was, we found was more needed was like you know something more durable, maybe perhaps a bit you know less sexy and you know uh, you know not something that uh, sort of self inflating is just there, but it actually is durable and, and uh, over the long haul and at a very reasonable price. We usually compare it that a lot of people think that you know what human parents like need is Formula Ones, but. You know, we, we think it's like more like an old, you know, Volkswagen or Ford. And I think that's uh, that's what we are trying to create. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Johan. Uh, Tom, before uh, before I uh, before we move on to a question for you, actually, actually, this this is a question from you from uh, from Sam Perkins um, from from Twitter. Um, so Sam's question, and and I direct this one to Tom. Uh, can transitional shelters distributed by UNHCR? And I'm gonna I'm gonna slightly amend this question. Um, can tra transitional shelters distributed by UNHCR and implementing partners and operating partners within the shelter uh, within the the shelter sphere be adapted to suit local conditions and crucially local needs by persons of concern over time? So I think this is a question about uh, transitioning. Um, and, and adding your own uh, modifications to shelters. So, Tom, over to you. Thank you. I mean, the, the point builds very on, very well uh, on from uh, the point made by Mr. Kincaid earlier, um, looking at self-built shelters. Let's look at four different types of shelter at the moment. Let's look at a, a permanent reconstruction, um, which is it could be an apartment building. Uh, when I was coordinating shelter for HCR back in in, in the Balkans, uh, that's what we were doing. Uh, but then let's move through, through to something that, that that requires building on site and it requires building durably. Yeah. The second type of shelter, let's take that as a standard transitional shelter as, as conceived, and that is again local build, as Mr. Kincaid was talking about earlier, using local materials, but it is something that transitions. The idea is that the materials that you give out to people are still used later on throughout the response. Now the difference between those first two different types are, in the first one, people haven't been displaced from their homes. In the second one, people have been displaced, they've been moved away, and because of that, and because of the duration of their displacement, we're going to have to find shelter with them that will help them be sheltered over the duration of their displacement. 
the third type of shelter would be Johan's transitional tent. Yeah, and that's that's not local build from local materials. That's an imported solution because maybe there aren't the local materials. Maybe we need that speed of response. Uh, maybe there's an environmental concern. The last type of shelter, the fourth type, might be a standard tent or a piece of plastic sheeting, tarpaulin, and some ropes. That again is very good for very early on, the immediate emergency phase. But the danger of that fourth type is that how are those materials going to be used over the longer term? How are they going to be an investment in durable solution? So what Johan's done with this transitional tent is he's created a very simple shed shape. Yeah? And that shed shape, you can put tin sheet, corrugated CGI roofing on the top. You could put mud walls up the side, or you could put um, uh, uh, mats, woven mats along the side. So there are lots of ways that this shelter can be upgraded over time. What Johan would have done, he would have bought time for those refugees, for those people of concern, to be able to, over time, upgrade and assist in their own sheltering process with what is available to hand on the ground. Johan's given them the head start, he's given them a bit of space to be able to regroup and, and, and upgrade their shelters. So, it, briefly, yes, you can upgrade transitional shelters and transitional tents. And, and that's the, the hope, is to, to, to bring in something initially which answers immediately their shelter needs that night. They have to sleep somewhere that night. Yeah? And then after that, enables them to upgrade over the duration of displacement and repair those shelters. Thanks very much, Tom. That's a, that's a great answer to, to Sam Perkins. Um, OK, so I wanted to, I wanted to, to ask uh, another question of you, Tom. Um, and I think, you, I think you've touched upon this when, when, you, when you talked us through the, the four different uh, types of shelter. Uh, just now, but what are some of the what are some of the other things you have to consider when selecting a shelter solution? Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna frame this question uh, for for an emergency response. Uh, initially, there's, there's there's what is there around on the ground? If you talk, are you talking, uh, Chris? Are you talking about selecting imported airliftable shelters, or are you talking about shelter in general in emergency context? Um, I was uh, I was actually talking about uh, shelter in general, but um, in this respect, I think we'll, we'll narrow the let's narrow the question down to, to imported shelters in particular. Right. So the only reason why you'd use an imported shelter is because the materials aren't there available to be able to, to do local shelter, or you need to move extraordinarily quickly because uh, there are uh, threats to people's lives uh, uh, through lack of shelter. Um, when you're selecting a shelter for that, you have a series of criteria. Um, the first is whether or not um, uh, it, it, it's, it's weight, it, it's and volume, and, and, and that's all about airlifting. Airlifting only really works if you've got a sub-100 kilo uh, uh, balanced volume um, uh, shelter. Yeah? So that's, that's one area. So we've got, we've got logistics concerns, we've got social concerns, we've got cost concerns. Let's take these three areas. So logistics I've already talked about a little bit. We've got airlift, we've got volume, uh, we've got speed of delivery, speed of deployment, there are a whole series of you know, have, have the, the shelter producers, have they got enough of them to be able to deliver them? Do, are we going to have to put different shelters next to each other from different manufacturers which may create tensions? You know? So that's the first logistics component of this. Now let's take the social component, the central component, is what is acceptable to the people uh, uh, concerned? And uh, what are the um, uh, climatic con conditions that they're used to? What are their traditions of living and so forth? There are some commonalities that can be arrived at, and, and we in the development of those standards, which, which uh, Johan then built way beyond uh, uh, our initial progress, um, uh, those initial standards were looking at social components and looking at livability, looking at do you want, for example, in a Muslim society to have a haramlik and a seremlik, a division between men and women within the shelter? Um, uh, do you have uh, cold climate use problems in, in, in people coming in and out of the shelter and all for what? And, and then also you've got the, 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 the technical, uh, more, more, more technical and uh, 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 procurement and financial concerns. And, and obviously there is a, a, a cost. There's not only a cost of the shelter, there's also a cost of deploying it. So you could have a very cheap shelter, but if you need to replace it frequently, the cost of that replacement, the cost of airlifting it in, uh, the cost of uh, uh, staff costs to be able to work that through, outweigh the cheaper cost of the tent. And so it's a balancing act to try to create a transitional tent that lasts long enough uh, to be able to, 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 to span the, the duration of displacement, but at the same time uh, can be upgraded to maximize its longevity. 
Um, there are also criteria, for example, about do people, are they going to need to move? Yeah? And, and obviously UNHCR is continually looking, seeking durable solutions with the, the refugees and persons of concern. So it's trying to help these people get back home again. And, and under certain circumstances, it may be valuable to have their shelter that can move back home with them. And that's where those weight criteria that we discussed with, with airlift become important. You need to be able to pack the thing up again and take it home and, and build it up because maybe your home, uh, remember that first category that we talked about earlier in terms of the four categories of shelter? Maybe when you go home, your apartment building, your house will have been damaged to beyond your use. So you'll need somewhere to live while that uh, uh, building is rebuilt uh, uh, by yourselves or, or, or by uh, the international aid community. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. That's uh, that's a that's a really really good um, that's a really good uh, overview of the the considerations that you might uh, take into account when uh, when deploying um, shelters from outside, uh, i.e., not local, not local, no, not locally available shelters. Um, we spoke about logistics. We spoke about uh, upfront costs of, of investment. We spoke about. Um, we spoke about the cost of deployment itself, um, and really crucially, I think um, you, you started to, to flesh out the, the social considerations, and not just from the from the shelter expert uh, who may be on the ground making those decisions, but also the, the acceptance of, uh, of refugees, of, of people of concern. And I think that's that's something uh, that um, that I think we could probably all agree is. Uh, Sometimes needs a little bit more work, um, but listen. I wanted to. I wanted to move on. Uh, Johan, um, can you can you talk to us a little bit about um, acceptable risk? Uh, how you make decisions around what is an acceptable risk um, when you uh, when you enter an R and D process um, of, uh, for example, the the better shelter unit. I think um, the risk in, in there, there, there are different um, kinds of risk. I think we have the, the foremost is the, the risk towards the end user in terms of safety uh, um, of a product. You know, it, I think that is the most important. What um, you know, what would happen if our product would uh, would fail? Um, you know, of course, you know, people would lose their home, but could they also get hurt? Or even worse, in terms of you know fire spreads, because we do, we do know a lot of people being cooked inside these shelters, even though they are not meant for that. You know, uh, so if there was a fire hazard, can people escape on time? You know, so, so, so the safety requirements for the end user they are very um, they are important, uh, and then we also need to, and then it's also the financial uh, risk that that we need to look how certain are we. That's more like addressing where the shelter that we have or any other solution where it works well, where it means the environmental requirements. Uh, we have a certain uh, lifespan. We know we have a known performance in many technical aspects of the shelter, but every place around the world is, is unique. You have different wind loads, you have different uh, you know, sun radiation, etc. So they need to assess that risk. We say, okay, is our shelter suitable in this region? Because it's um, the, the upfront cost really pay off over time uh, to use this uh, shelter. And acceptable risk to set that. And I think it's important to have a, a, a benchmark of risk of what is the current option uh, that we are having uh, today. Uh, what, what are we comparing this to? We're comparing to a tent or transitional shelter. Then we need to find a, a risk level which is on, on, at least on par with this, uh, preferably better off. But we may not be able, even though that was our intention, you know, to fully you know implement like a UVP and building code or, or a standard uh, uh, onto the shelter itself. Uh, I think that is the minimum requirement. And then again, before testing, also before usage testing, when piloting these things, that is also important to remember that these are people who. Who haven't chosen to to always live in this shelter? They haven't chosen to become refugees. They are forced to do it. So it makes it very different to design a refugee shelter than to make, for example, a new vacuum, you know, a cleaner. Uh, and then you have a focus group, and they use your vacuum cleaner, you know, for two months, and they ask, them, "How was it?" Here, we need to pay much more uh, attention to safety, you know, uh, to safety factors before productive pilot. And, that's also why it took us quite a long time before we could get the shelter out in the field because we needed to test as much as we could on the technical performance of the shelter 
you know, that it's safe. And then for the pilot study, so to verify that we have set the right requirements in the first place, uh, uh, because a technical failure could be even that we had it wasn't produced according to our specifications, or there was a problem with our specifications. But foremost, it was to get the user impact to the shelter. How is it living inside this? You know, how is the privacy? What would you like to improve, uh, etc. Thanks, uh, thanks, Johan. And I, I seem to remember when we were we were both in uh, in Dolorado in uh, in southeast Ethiopia when um, when we were planning the uh, planning the, the the user testing of the of the first refugee housing unit shelters in the in the field together with uh, with our our friends and colleagues from the shelter and settlement section of of UNHCR. Uh, we we did a lot of work um, just speaking to people about. Uh, uh, you know, did, did they want to try this new approach with us? Yeah. Uh, what were their concerns? Um, did they not want to try this new approach with us? Um, and and we we spent a lot a lot of time with the with the communities uh, we, before we before we even uh, before we even brought any any RHUs down to down to Dolorado. And I, I remember we had some some great conversations um, with uh, with Hassan and and some of the other guys down there. When when we were just showing pictures and we were uh, we were kind of explaining you know what what does the solar what does the solar part mean what what are the panels made of and um, what are the possibilities for for return and and repatriation we had a great a great uh, a great build up to to introducing the actual shelters themselves um, so listen I wanted to I wanted to ask uh, Tom. Um, and I and I think I think you've 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 touched upon this you've touched upon this already. But I I wanted to really understand, um, you know, when we when we when we look at context and, and earlier we were talking about uh, the emergency context. But how do you create a shelter design that's adaptable to a range of contexts? You know, are we are we just talking about weather? Are we just talking about culture? What what are what are some of the the considerations that that you uh, you think that we need to to consider? Yes, yeah, so Johan has an impossible job. He has to create a one shelter which will fit every circumstance in often the most extreme environments in the world, supporting people who have very, very different needs. And uh, um, uh, there are also different um, operational concerns there, as I said, about return and so forth. That's uh, an equation where every component part is a variable. It's, 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 it's an impossible job unless you start looking at it systematically as Johan has done, which means to start, rather than creating a, 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 an average where that meets none of those criteria, to create an enabling tool, something that can be genuinely adapted to different contexts. Now, let's take those points one by one. Let's take the social first. Very different lifestyles, but also people of different age, you've got gender concerns going there as well, with people wanting to, to live in different ways, and protection against gender-based violence. You, you've got a number of other components about uh, family size, about how uh, communities work together, about unaccompanied uh, uh, people in that society as well. All you can do to start with that is to create a shelter, and then also have that adaptability component on top to be able to allow that load of local modification. I'm, I'm sure Johan will admit that any average shelter, any, any shelter created on an average for a global use, all that we know about it is that when it arrives, it isn't quite yet fit for purpose. It must be adapted to local circumstances. He cannot create a shelter that is universal. It is, it is physically impossible to do so. What he can do is create the process and the enabling tool, the device, his shelter, which will allow all of the rest to actually happen. Then you get on to the climatic concerns. I've been asked to, to winterize uh, camps designed for the summer and summarize camps uh, uh, developed for, for, for the winter. Um, uh, you often end up with extreme climatic ranges. Let's take um, uh, 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 Pakistan or Iraq. It gets very cold and very hot. Deserts get cold in the winter at night especially. And you've got huge problems with conductive heat loss through the ground. If if someone lies on the ground and goes to sleep, you know, they are at risk of their lives because of the conducted heat lost through their body and through the ground. And so we need to create an environment where the internal um, uh, space can be again adapted to different circumstances. The logistic stuff I think we have touched upon. Um, the need sometimes for the shelter to be relocated. But that is Having a relocatable shelter then enables us to avoid the circumstance of investing in a permanent shelter in an area where permanent occupation cannot happen. There's no point building 
permanent houses in a refugee camp. Uh, uh, it may also be politically very difficult to do so. And therefore, this approach enables in the specific circumstances we talked, and I come back to, to Mr. Kincaid's point at, at, right at the beginning, the majority of shelters are locally built, which in those circumstances where we need what Johan's developed, um, uh, it's, it's very good that we can then adapt the result. Thanks very much, Tom. That was a, that was a, great, uh, a great answer uh, to quite a complicated question. Um, so this is uh, the next question. Is I'm going to start with uh, I'm going to I'm going to put it to uh, to Johan, uh, and then I'm going to ask uh, Tom for for your inputs as well um, before we uh, before we wrap up this session. Um, this is a this is a question that that is is very topical uh, because in in UNHCR innovation at least we're we're seeing um, we're seeing um, a lot of our projects getting getting to the point. Uh, where they where they will be or should be or need to be scaled um, or at least handed over to another part of UNHCR uh, they will have passed the prototyping uh, point they will have um, they will have a lot of evidence to to suggest that they they should be scaled or could be scaled um, but one thing that I think we we see a lot of in the in the humanitarian sector um, is, is is this kind of notion of pilotisis um, it seems to be quite a big challenge uh, in the sector um, not limited to, to UNHCR, definitely not limited to shelter, but you know we, we invest money in an R&D process. We invest money um, you know, testing some of these some of these solutions or some of these systems in, in a variety of different um, environments operating environments. Um, so Johan, what do you see? I mean, you, you've been you've been working with with UNHCR for the for the past couple of years. Your your solution, your shelter solution that you've developed a, along with us, is is really starting to to scale. But what are some of the biggest challenges that you see as somebody who works with us but doesn't work uh, directly for us, uh, UNHCR? What do you see as being some of the biggest challenge in, in moving from prototype through to through to production? Yeah, I think, uh, the the biggest challenge, I think, starts actually before the prototype itself. It starts uh, when getting an agreement or consensus about what do we want to create. Uh, that's, I think, it's very hard for for any uh, union agency to say or to, you know to, because it's no. It's not like in a company where you have someone who is head of product development and says, okay, this is what we want. No, let's go for it. This is you know we have many stakeholders in the organization. Uh, there is Geneva, and then there is the field, and so, so, so the organization it is much you know bigger. It's more complex um, than, uh, and the more people involved, I would say in, in UNHCR, uh, than it would have been if we would have done this project for a company like IKEA, for example, because then this would be at some you know mid-level manager's desk looking at the you know the, the, the financial size of, of this project. Uh, and he would have all the mandate and right to make a decision. So, so decision making is, is different. And then um, uh, I think that then, then there's also a challenge with incentives for innovation. I think within UNHCR and the humanitarian world, and I think even at Shelter Center, I mean, with Tom, we have had these discussions many times. There is a challenge with open innovation. I think in the humanitarian world, there's an idea. That innovation should be open source uh, because this worked for the you know for the web you know it works for, for you know a lot of software you know it's, it's, and it's, it is a very nice idea that we make something which you know everybody can share. However, when it comes to hardware, it is different because there are quite significant investments that need to be made in R and D and you know in in producing prototypes which are fairly expensive and. And also conducting the, the trials, and as any like businessman to have an incentive to invest in this is that they would know that they would have a return on their investment in case uh, the the solution would be you know successful. You know? So so would um, would uh, one any company make a solution which would be approved and uh, you know agree this is good? Then at least I think the companies would like to know that hey we are going to get the, the right to deliver. Whereas with the UNHCR and many other organizations we have discussed with, okay, let's develop this together. When we, when we have reached to a solution, then let's open source it and go for public procurement. And by doing that, we take out the uh, incentives for many private sector 
in investors. Unfortunately, we have had IKEA Foundation, which is the philanthropic arm of IKEA, and you know, not to be mixed up with IKEA Furniture Company, uh, who have supported us a lot. But we have had these challenges, and we have had these challenges with our suppliers, uh, even when we have been paying for their development. They had said that. We're not sure we want to do this development if we're going to open source it, because we are living from this. You know. We are producing, for example, hand manufacturers. You know. we are, uh, it's our everyday you know, you know, um, income is from producing this kind uh, of plastics. And we happen to be the world leader in this. We're the only one who knows to do this. We're not sure, even if you pay us, that we want to do R&D if you're going to put it up open source. So I think that idea is also uh, Creates sort of conflicts in the in, in the innovation uh, process. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Johan. Um, so, so Tom, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you the the same question, and 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 I note that uh, you you know you, your engagement with uh, within the humanitarian uh, shelter sphere uh, ex exceeds probably mine and mine and Johan's uh, experience in the professional world uh, combined. Um, but I also wanted to to kind of um, Really provide a bit more context to, to shelter center and and the uh, and the role that it plays in uh, in pulling together uh, the humanitarian shelter community. Um, it has a unique position in in the in the shelter community. So, uh, with with that context, I ask you the the same question: um, How do you? Uh, what do you see as being some of the biggest challenges in moving from prototype uh, to production? And the, the, the simple answer and the quick answer is consensus uh, within various groups. Um, uh, over the, the, the length of my involvement in this uh, uh, sector, um, it has been obvious that the series of shelters that have been developed, I, I've seen four or five shelters be developed in, within UNHCR alone. Um, the opportunity is that if we could all get together on the humanitarian side and agree what color and shape, and then we can communicate that clearly to the manufacturers so that Johan can see where he should make his investments. Um, what happened in this circumstance, of course, is, is Johan, in, in, in forming a relationship with UNHCR, was able to say, well, we've taken that process, which is that consensus process, that's been done. Now what we need to do is to take it on to its next step and start producing these things. Consensus is going to come back again as being important later on because not only will um, Johan want to sell his shelters to other agencies, uh, uh, therefore he needs to make sure that those other agencies want to buy his shelter, and, and that's why having consensus standards at the beginning is a very good idea, but also in we, we, we don't only want one manufacturer producing tents, and, and, and Johan alluded to that as well, in that they're rapidly prototyping a highly intricate, sophisticated system, which is actually becoming simpler. Now that's the whole point of, of this R&D phase is to get the, the product functionally simple, yeah? uh, as well as resolving um, a, a, a whole bunch of things which is uh, encountered with you in Doloado and elsewhere. But then once that's happened, and we need to then interest other manufacturers in being involved in creating alternatives, in engaging competition, and being able to answer the same standards, the same problems in new, innovative, different ways. This is not a, a process which is going to end with, with a, a, a perfect shelter. It's a process which will and should continue forever. And people like Johan and the capacity that he brings to bear must be an incremental improvement. We can't keep redesigning the same shelter again. We've got to make it better and better and better each time. And the last word is to make that happen. We need to record what's gone on. We need to make that information, the science behind it, the technology behind it, open source in terms of heat conduction through the floor and so forth. So if you look on, on humanitarianlibrary.org where we, we uh, have a, a channel it's called, rather like on YouTube, a channel uh, uh, on transitional tents, you'll be able to see all of the research that went into that over the last dozen years where we've looked at various aspects of structures and heat conduction, uh, the social components you were talking about before and those standards. And that foundation enables Johan to make the next table to come back to something which is broadly agreed, which other agencies can purchase, increasing the volume of sales, which allows Johan to create greater investments, in improving his product, yeah, and then finally end up with a variety of solutions to the same problem, so that we can keep this, this innovation generated by competition, which is necessary if we're going to improve these products without continual central investment. 
thank you, uh, thank you to, to both of you. Um, I think the, the two different perspectives uh, really converged uh, around the notion of consensus. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, before we uh, before we wrap up the session, um, we've got uh, another question. Actually, we've got two two questions from uh, Rowena Chiang. Um, I'm going to go for the I'm going to go for the second question. Um, she says that significant investment needs to be made uh, to hardware innovation. Uh, why can't we make it open source? Uh, Johan, uh, maybe you can uh, tell us uh, about future plans around shelter designs and and, op and the open source nature yeah. of them that, that Tom's also uh, commented mm -hmm. on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the challenge with open source is that somewhere down the line, uh, you know, an investor or an organization is going to need to make a decision, put some money on the table to invest in a new production line, and. Um, they will not do that until they know that they have um, a right to deliver their product. You know, they will not invest in R and D um, if they know that they don't have the right to deliver. Because then, what you will encourage is for people to sit back and wait. <laughs> you know, what will come, and then they will not set up production um, uh, lines for hypothetical orders or for or for you know open sourcing their knowledge because then they would invite uh, competition. So. Really, that you know, to to make investors have a, a return on the investment in R and D. That's where we need to protect. Um, uh, for, you know, have to intellectual property you know, uh, protected. However, uh, we are we are a, you know a social company, and we I think we have found a very good way here together with UNHCR, where we had said that yes, we're going to have our you know specifications open sourced after two years uh, of delivery. Uh, to UNHCR, we're gonna open source it uh, because that time it should give us a decent, you know, uh, chance to get our, you know, investments re recap, and then we're gonna open source it after two years to invite competitions. And if we cannot be competitive after these two years, you know, of learning and trial to producing this and setting this up, if we are not competitive, then then honestly we don't have the right to to produce this <laughs> shelter anymore. And second, I think. That one to open source the, the to have these short what you call the short contracts in, in terms of exclusivity uh, on things important rights together with an open book principle that is uh, very key. I mean we are very transparent with UNHCR uh, on our costings. Any surplus that we make, we reinvest in, in R and D for the humanitarian you know humanitarian shelters. I think if we would have been a, you know standard. Private company, we would have shown and been able to distribute around seven percent of our profits to our distributors. We don't do that, but I think that is fair. But it should not be more than that. We should not misuse our position. So I think like a short-term exclusivity in terms of intellectual property rights, together with an open book policy where you put a cap on profit distributions. I think this is a mix um, that that will um, you know do the trick that will make this innovation work. Uh, of course, this is the first time that we are doing it. We don't know about many other projects who have done this uh, before, but, but we are very optimistic because now we see that we can balance the you know the financial risk that have been invested in the project uh, with the need of you know open source solution to, to create the best end price uh, possible in the future. Thanks, Johan. Uh, that's a, a really comprehensive, uh, really comprehensive reply. Um, so. We've had some uh, we've had some really great uh, questions uh, from uh, from people following the following the conversation also on on Twitter. So uh, I wanted to I wanted to say a few thank yous before we before we wrap up uh, today's session. Um, first of all, I wanted to to say thank you to to Ross, uh, to Sam, and to Rowena for for, for giving us some uh, some tough questions. Um, we like them; they're good. Um, and we have some, um, and we, we've seen the, the depth of uh, response that we that we were lucky enough to have uh, from from Johan and also from Tom. So, secondly, I wanted to, to say a big thank you to, to Johan and Tom for, for joining us today, uh, for giving for giving your thoughts and letting us tap into your your co core competencies, for, for letting us tap into to your experience. Uh, it's a it's a really um, it's a really interesting and and very important conversation to be having, and this is, this really is just a representation of, of the tip of the iceberg. Um, you both work uh, in you know boots on the ground, uh, working out the nitty gritty of, of shelter response uh, to to provide the best shelter possible for for refugees and other 
people of concern. Um, thirdly, I wanted to say a big thank you to, to Plus Social Good. Um, we've been, we're, we're launching, uh, we have launched um, this monthly online hangout series. Um, it's a collaboration between UNHCR Innovation and, and Plus Social Good. Um, today's uh, session looked at alternative shelter design for humanitarian crises. Our first uh, session looked at SMS technologies. Um, we're going to be having another, um, another live event in one month's time. Um, so I wanted to ask our today's audience, uh, anybody who's listening into today's session and anyone who's, who's following on Twitter, um, we, we'd love for you to be able to tweet suggestions to um, at UNHCR Innovation and uh, Plus Social Good um, suggestions for next month's topic. Um, this is a really, really exciting series to, to be kind of co-sponsoring together with uh, Plus Social Good. We're really excited about it um, and we're excited uh, to have the next month's conversation. So um, with that said, um, I wanted to say again, big thank you to, to everyone uh, for, for today's discussion. Uh, my name is Chris Ernie, I'm the co-lead of UNHCR Innovation. Um, thank you very much.